Turn your Bibles, if you will, tonight to Revelation chapter number 22. Revelation chapter number 22, as we'll stay back there. It's good to see Brother Ernest tonight. Amen. I see him over there. Praise the Lord. I'm glad he's here. And I'm glad that you're here tonight as well. Thank the Lord for that. Genesis chapter, I mean, uh, Revelation chapter number 22 tonight. Revelation chapter number 22. We're going to start reading in verse number one and read a few verses tonight. And, uh, and then we'll. Find what the Lord would have us to be able to do. Remind you again, the Lord is coming back. Praise the Lord. And uh, it is a promise, and I thank God for that. And I praise the Lord for His faithfulness. Genesis chapter number, I mean, Revelations. I keep trying to go to the front of the Bible. We're in the back of the Bible, amen? Revelations chapter number 22. And we will end up being in the Genesis tonight, sooner or later, though. The Bible says this in verse number 1 of Revelations chapter number 22. And He showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on the other side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and, shall name, uh, and His name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle nor light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. I want you to notice that word shortly there. He, when's Jesus coming back? When's he coming shortly? A lot of folks ask, when's the Lord coming back? And shortly. Sometimes we want to know, we think we know because of the different times of prophecy. We think it's right around the corner. It is around the corner, but the Bible makes it plain that no man knoweth. And I want to say this to you, he does not give us an exact time, but I can promise you it is an exact promise. We know without a doubt that Jesus is coming back. I can remember when I was a kid and I would be traveling a lot of times, just as any other kid, I'd ask my dad or my mom for that matter, when are we going to be there? And I did not get an exact time. I did not get an exact moment, though children and teenagers sometimes like exact things. My father would respond to me and he would say shortly. And what I learned is he would not be specific with me, but there's one thing for sure that whatever he said, it would happen, and it's coming. In the same way that my earthly father was that way, is the same way, praise God, our heavenly father's that way. He don't owe us an exact time. He does not owe us. There's one thing we know, though. He said he's coming again, and praise God, he's coming again. Amen? So he says, shortly. And then notice that he says, if you go a little further, verse number, one, verse number seven, behold. That word behold means pay attention. In other words, Jesus, when he said it to Simon, Peter, 
He said, behold, he said, look at me, pay attention, give me your undivided attention. What does he follow it with? He says, behold, I come quickly. Amen. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen and fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things, then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God, he says. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of, this pro of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Verse number 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Notice again, and behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Notice if you will in verse number 7 where the word says this, Behold, I come quickly. Verse number 12, you see it again. Behold, I come quickly. I want to ask you a question. If you're in a business or habit of writing things in your Bible, you can circle that or underline that. But I want to ask you a personal question tonight. Because of the statement found in verse number 7 and in verse number 12, I come quickly. What difference has that made in your life? How are you living your life different tonight because the Lord says, I come quickly? I mean, He made it very plain. It's, it's obvious. We know God's not a liar. We know that the Word of God is true. We say that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that He gave His life, that He hung on the cross of Calvary. That he died, that he rose again. We believe that. We believe without any question that he's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. We believe that he's coming soon. And we believe that it's at any moment. But if that's the case, then how are you living your life different? What's different right now as a teenager, as a young man, as a father, as a husband, as a, wo as a woman, as a, as a wife, as a mom, as a, 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 as a servant of God, as a Christian, as a child of God? How are you living differently tonight because Jesus said it plain, I come quickly. What are you doing tonight that you never done before because you know Jesus is coming quickly? What are you removing tonight that should not be in your life because Jesus says, I've come quickly. I mean, listen, we've been dabbling around in different things. We've been living our life the way that we want to live it. We have had priorities. The Lord slowed us down the last couple of months, and all of a sudden it was like we got our priorities in check. And I don't know about you, friend, but I'm not preaching at you. I'm with you. I was talking to one of our deacons today, and I even told him out of my own mouth, ever since things have went back, I have found myself being more busy. I don't like it. I, I've got to be able to stop and slow down, let the Holy Ghost change some things. Why? Because I know that Jesus is coming soon. And I don't want to go back to the busyness, and I don't want to go back to the routine, and I don't want to go back to people being dormant and just having church and being busy, being mad and being bitter, being frustrated being so overwhelmed that they're ineffective, that they have no peace, no hope, no joy. I don't want to go back to the vision. I don't want to go back to people just doing me and me and mine being okay and being separated. I don't want to go back to that. Listen, sometimes we got to slow down and remind ourselves that Jesus is coming back. That's not an emotional thing. It's not a thought. It's not something we came up with in our mind. It's not something that we're making up. It's not fiction. No, it is a biblical truth. Jesus said, I come quickly. So I ask you again tonight, how are you living different because Jesus is coming back? What's changing in our lives as a church, as a ministry, as a home, as a marriage, as a young person, as a couple? Listen, how are you living differently if we say that we believe Jesus is coming back? 
I would dare say if we believe it, then we believe that Jesus is coming back in any moment. We believe that Jesus said it very plain, that he comes as a thief in the night. We have no idea when he's going to come. So if he's going to come at any time and anything like that, listen, we, we have to understand it's going to happen. And when it happens, there are going to be no second chances whatsoever. I'm going to ask you something. Does, does it fear you at all that Jesus is coming back? Are you afraid? If he come right now, is there something in our lives that we don't want him to talk about? I mean, as if he did not know. We know that he knows. But listen, if he came right now, is there somebody? Is there something? Is there a habit right now that's in our life that we're scared that he might come back at a certain time because we caught in the middle of that habit, that habit, the middle of that moment? I mean, is there something that is fearful that our priorities, just like I was speaking today, that I found myself to be so busy that things are happening? I mean, listen, I mean, we got to think about it now because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. But what we do know is this, is that Jesus is coming back. And I remind you, if we're living right, we should not be afraid that he's coming back. Right. I'm not afraid when my wife's coming home because our relationship's right. I'm not afraid when I see her pulling in the driveway because our relationship's right. I'm not upset when it happens. Why? Because the relationship's right. And when your relationship is right with your heavenly father, you and I should not be afraid that he's coming back. Amen. I can remember when I was a child, though. And my mom would say, your daddy's coming home. Maybe something happened that day at school. And I knew that my father was not going to be pleased. And maybe some of you were better children than I was. But I can remember when I knew there was going to be something he was not pleased with. There was a fear. And forgive me for just being transparent with that. But there was a fear because I knew when I seen my daddy. I knew that there was going to be something that he was not going to be pleased with. And I'm telling you something. We better make our lives right if we believe he's coming back, we need to live right, right now. Priorities should be put in check right now. What are your priorities? Not what you think, not what you feel, not what you believe. It's what the Bible says. Those are our priorities. Church, the assembling of ourselves, it is a priority. Living for Jesus and worshiping, it is a priority. Listen, tithing and serving and working for the Lord Jesus, it is a priority. Witnessing and telling people about Jesus, it is a priority. These are the priorities that matter. Amen. And we're so busy doing everything else. It's just like these ministries. Listen, we've got back now to where we're ministering to people. That is what matters, not games and activities. I love camps and I love vacation Bible schools. and I love all the activities. They're going out to eat breakfast. That, those are all great. But what matters above all things are not the things that fill the calendar to say we've done something. What matters is that we're pouring our life into somebody else and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what matters above all things. And in this text in Revelation chapter number 22, you see twice, Jesus says, I come quickly. He divides it in two sections. And I want to give you these two things tonight, three things about what happens when he comes and three things that happens until he comes. The first I say tonight is three things that happen when he comes. What is it? Number one, we praise God will see him when he comes. Notice if you will, the Bible says there in verse number four, it says, and they shall see his face. Praise God, you and I will see the Lord Jesus. You could see me and I can see you and I'm telling you when Jesus comes back, we will see him as we see each other. I'm thankful that I don't have to see him just by the eyes of faith. I'll be able to see him physically in front of me. I praise the Lord that you and I will be able to see the Lord Jesus. It is a reality. You will see the Lord Jesus. And I praise the Lord for that. And it will not just be for one day. It will not just be for some days. It will be for eternity. And we ought to rejoice to be able to know when today these eyes behold wickedness and it sees sin every single, single day. We see all these problems. There are going to come a day where it's all going to pass away. And our eyes will behold the King of kings and the Lord of lords for eternity. And we ought to rejoice tonight to be able to know that. He says in this text, he says that literally that when we do, notice in verse number four, he says, and we shall see his face. And listen, his name shall be in their foreheads. In other words, that it's like we're going to be marked. Now, here's what that means is why being marked, that means that we're going to have access 
literally have access. Now, right now, you want to have access to be able to pray. We can be able to pray through the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm talking about we have access because it is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are with Him. We are as one with Him. And every day, I mean, everything then will we'll behold. We're, we're with Him. We're walking. We're, 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 we're learning. And everybody thinks, well, I'll know everything when I get to heaven. No, you won't, friend. You will learn everything when you get to heaven, but you won't know everything. Listen, we serve a, a God that, 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 that has, knows all things, that his, his, his ability, his, the beginning, the end, there, there is no such start to him. There is no finish to him. I mean, you're going to see the Lord Jesus, but we will have access because we will be marked by God. So what does that say to us? Notice, if you will, a couple things. It connects everything. We have this access. Notice in verse number one, the Bible says this, and he showed me a pure river of water of what? Life. Notice he goes down to verse number two. He says, and on the tree of life. So the first thing that we're connected to whenever we have access is this. When we see him, that we'll have life. We'll have life. Life for eternity. There'll be no sickness, there'll be no sorrow, there'll be no death, there'll be no passing, there'll be nothing, there'll be life. Listen, you better live, there'll be health, there'll be, there'll be no problems, no pain, no, no viruses, no corona, there'll be nothing, nothing. There'll be life and life forevermore. And here's what's so amazing. When he said that the tree of life, it is given to us, why? When you go back to Adam and Eve, what did he do? He removed the tree of life. But do you see that whenever we get to the place to where we stand before the Lord Jesus and we see him, he gives us back the tree of life. And what that teaches us is this, everything that Adam and Eve lost in the garden, God will give back to us and we'll be able to live forever. And we can rejoice because we have access to that. And I want to ask you, how are you living your life different tonight because God's, going to be so, God's been so good to you? Not only will we have life, but notice what he says in verse number two. We also will be able to find love. Listen to what he says. He says, in the midst of the tree of it, he says, uh, there is a tree of life. He said, which bear 12 manner of fruits and yielded her uh, a fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The leaves were for the healing of the nations. We're living in a place where we're so wounded and so scarred and so hurtful. And do you realize that one day when we see Jesus and we're with him, that we will experience a love that we've never, 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 ever comprehended. Now, we've experienced it, but there's complete healing in the Lord Jesus Christ. There'll be no more problems. There'll be no more division. There'll be, there'll be nothing. Listen, everything will be fine. Why? Because the Lord is there and praise God, not only is the Lord there, but we're with the Lord. So he gives us life. He gives us love. But then notice this. He gives us light. Verse number five, the Bible says this. It says, and there shall be no night there because God is light. So here we are. We'll be with the Lord and praise God, he'll be with us. So what will happen when he comes? We will see him. Number one, number one, we will see him. Number two, you can write this down, we will serve him. Now most people think that when you get to heaven, it's just going to be an easy street. We're going to hang out and put our feet up and everything's going to be easy. We're not going to worry about nothing. But that's not what the Bible says because when you go, I want you to look at those first number three. The Bible says, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God with the Lamb be in it and his servants shall serve him. Amen. Praise God, we'll be able to serve the Lord forever. Amen. What's the greatest thing that could be said about your life? Matter of fact, I've been studying some in the Psalms, and some of you will read, and you'll see the titles of Psalms. In Psalms chapter number 18, it was a couple of days ago, I was reading it. And when you read it, it was David. David wrote the Psalm, and it did not say David, the, the, the father of Solomon. It did not they say the great psalmist. It, it didn't say that. No, it said David, a servant of God. Is there any better title to have? Is there anything better than anybody could ever say to, say to you or about you than you are a servant of God? And praise God, listen, when we see him, we'll be able to serve him. And we'll be able to do it not just for one day, but we'll be able to do it for eternity. Thank the Lord for that. But not only will we see him or will we serve him, but also we will sit with him. Notice what the Bible says in verse number five. It says, and there should be no night there, no candle, nor light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now we understand that when you come to this place, 
Here, this is the eternal reign. This is not just a millennial reign. This is the eternal reign. So that means that literally that we're going to be able to be seated with him. When you study out the scriptures, the Bible says that that the devil will be under the foot of the Lord. Listen, this is at the place not only is he under the foot of the Lord, but if you study out Romans chapter number 16, verse number 20, that also shortly he'll be under our foot too. Do you understand? In other words, this is a place of complete victory in our life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There is no spiritual warfare. There is no problem. Listen, friend, don't get excited. You're going to go to heaven, but you're going to go to heaven. You understand? You're going to see the Lord. It's not just what a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see. No, that's not just a song we're going to be singing. You and I will literally see the Lord Jesus. We will serve the Lord Jesus. But not only that, we will sit with the Lord Jesus. And we'll have access to everything that God has ever promised to us. We'll have access to that. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more division. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more questions. Praise God, there won't be no more news media. No, it'll be all about Jesus one day. And I ask you again, how are you living your life different because of it? As a young lady and young man right now, What are you doing different in your life? Because one day you're going to be able to see Jesus. What's different? And I'll go a little bit further. I'll say this. If it don't matter to you, then you might want to ask yourself why it don't matter. Hey, listen to me, friend. If talking about heavenly things does not change your earthly living, you've got a problem spiritually. Are you understanding? I mean, listen, when you think about heaven and you think about God and you think about the holiness of God and Jesus Christ died for your sin and you hear about that and it does not change the way you and I live on earth, we have a problem spiritually. It should make us want to be able to live different. Listen, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you know as well as I do, a lot of times when kids begin to rebel, why do they rebel? They rebel because somewhere down the line, Something happened in a home where they begin to lose trust with mom or dad. Somewhere, not all cases, but divorce, drugs, alcohol, abuse begins to happen. Listen to me, I'm not meddling. I'm telling you this is what happens. We begin, it begins to change us because we lose respect. But can I tell you something? There's no such thing in our Heavenly Father. He's never let us down. He's never separated us. He's never abused us. He's never hurt us. We ought to be able to give our hearts to Him. We ought to be able to give our lives lives to Him. We ought to be able to give our service to Him. We ought to be able to give our calendars to Him. We ought to be able to give our money to Him. We ought to be able to give our children to Him. We ought to be able to give our future to Him. We ought to be able to give our pain to Him. He deserves it all. Why? Because He's worthy tonight. And I'm telling you, we're holding back. And listen, all we're missing out on is the things of God. God has got a plan for our life and our home and our marriage and our ministry. God's got a plan. And the only person that suffers when we hold back is us. It's us. So not only do you see the things that happen when he comes, but what's the three things that should happen until he comes? If you're with me tonight, say amen. Amen. Number one, until he comes. Notice verse number seven and eight. Follow along with me. And behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to, what's that next word, church? Worship. Until he comes, I should give attention to his worship. Did you hear what I said? Until he comes, I should give attention to worship. I want to ask you tonight, how's your worship? How's your worship? He made it very plain. As a matter of fact, you go a little bit further, he gets to verse number nine, and the angel's sitting here and he says, No, it's not me. I'm a fellow servant. He says, Worship God. In other words, don't worship me, worship the Lord, worship God, Amen. worship Him. And I want to ask you, how is your worship? And just today, how much time did you give to the news? How much time did you eat? How much time did you spend with friends? How much time did you talk? How much time did you work for Uncle Sam? You hearing me tonight? How much time did you read? How much time did you sleep because you felt like you needed sleep? Now here's a question. How much time did you worship? Are you listening to me? 
Well, I'm at church. It's a Wednesday night. Listen, worship is not a public thing. It's a private thing. It's a private thing. You say, you believe that? Genesis chapter number 22, what did he say? I and the lad will go yonder. Why? Because we're going to go worship. First time worship was ever seen in the Word of God. It was not something publicly. It was done privately. And Abraham went a little further and he worshiped the Lord. And I want to ask you, how much time do you worship in your private life? Music don't matter. Does it not matter? Our conversations don't matter. Does it not matter? I'm not meddling. I'm not picking. I'm not prying. I'm not doing it. Listen, every time you get in that car, listen to me, friend. Every time you and I get in that car, we have a chance to worship the Lord. Nobody around, just me and God right there driving down the road and the Holy Ghost begin to stir something on the inside of you where you're weeping and riding down the road with joy, praying and talking to the Lord. I'm talking, you can worship all day long driving around. It matters what we do. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And it's coming closer every single day. And we forfeit, we abort these opportunities well, I don't agree with that preacher. And he ain't got to agree with it. It's what the Bible says. It's what the Bible says. I want to ask you how your worship is. How's your worship? I wrote this down in my notes. If we become better worshipers, we become better workers. Amen. If you want to be a better worker, you need to be a better worshiper. If you want to be a better witness, you need to be a better worshiper. You know why? It's easy to get out and talk about somebody after you've been talking to them all the way there. <laughs> hey, man. It's easy, friend. It's, it's, it's easy to be able to do something for the Lord. But the problem is, listen, we're so busy with everything else, but we're not busy with worship. Right. Listen, if you want to know what matters to somebody, look at their schedule and look at their bank account. How much time did you and I waste today doing something else? All those things that I mentioned, listen, we all the things. And by the way, and you know, so can, can we just be transparent for Hadn't it just drained us? Amen. Exhausted? Man, I was telling you, I was talking to one of the men today. That was, my, that was the very thing that I was talking about. It, 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 life drains me. Whose fault is it? Mine. Whose fault is it? It's yours. I'm not saying quit your job and stop and, you know, walk outside and get a tree and fall down on your knees all day long. I'm not saying that, all right? I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you this, everything that we do, we should give thanks for the Lord and we should do it for His honor and His glory. Amen. Everything we do. Amen. And I want to ask you this question just while we're here and we'll let the Holy Ghost take it. Is everything you do give Him honor and glory? Every person you talk to, everything you hang out with, every person you hang out with, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your friends, your conversations, the person you eat lunch with, does that give him honor and glory? Because it's kind of hard to do so if we're around the wrong people doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So I tell you, until he comes, we need to worship. Not only do we need to give attention to worship, but I want you to know, secondly, we need to give attention to the word. Amen. Notice verse number 10. And he saith unto me, seal not. He didn't say seal it. <laughs> he didn't say close it. What did he say? He said seal not. Right. Seal not. Look, listen. That means open it up. Seal not what? Notice. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. Give attention to the word of God. This is the time that we should be opening the word. And we should be reading the word. And. Listen, this ain't a time to be able to just keep it to yourself and, and, and not tell nobody. No, this is a time that we should be telling people about Jesus. Hello, listen to me. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you're a leader, I'm not asking you when the last time you taught somebody. I'm not asking the last time you quoted something. When's the last time you shared the Word of God with somebody because it was on your heart to do so? Yes. Not because you have a title, listen. Yes. Not because you have a position, not because you have a responsibility, but because Jesus Christ lives inside of you. Amen. When's the last time? When's the last time? Right. We want to be effective. We want to make a difference. But we make everything else a priority. But Jesus, 
They said, may our children know, may my son know, may he understand that above sports and activity and education and running back and forth, even above just going to church, listen, open up the Word of God, fill your life with the Word of God, hide the Word of God in your heart that you might not sin against God. May you understand it matters right now to be in the book and to share the book. Who's the last person you told about Jesus? Who's the last person that you claimed the Bible verse? Who is it? Can you quote a verse? You know, it's always, it's always beautiful when children, when teenagers, when teenagers graduate high school from Christian school, they have a life verse. Does mom and dad have a life verse? And does your children know what the life verse is? Huh? He said, still not. God wants us to open the book. We want to open it up to be able to talk about it. Talk to your friends. Talk to your co-workers. Hello, listen to me. I know them children's talking about it. They're praise the Lord. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Let them talk. They don't bother me none. Don't bother me none. Listen, you thank God for them, you better open the book. All right, are you listening to me? If you thank God for them, you better open the book. They're a blessing from the Lord. Listen, they need a mom and a dad. They need a friend. They need a teacher. They need somebody to open the book. And we'll get on. We'll get talking to friends. But are we talking about Jesus? We're talking to family. But are we talking about Jesus? We'll get on social media. But are we talking about Jesus? We'll post about everything. Every politician. We'll post about every football game and basketball game. We'll post about every little thing that we see about the news and, and how crooked and wicked they are. But listen, when's the last time you posted about Jesus? We'll get on Snapchats and chats and uh, he chats and she chats and all these other chats that we do. But when's the last time you got on there not to date somebody, but to tell somebody about Jesus? Jesus is coming back. How's it change your living? Jesus is coming back. It's a reality. It's true. It's honest. It's pure. It's a promise. Jesus is coming back. Not only does he say as he comes, until he comes to give attention to his worship, give attention to his word, but lastly tonight, give, atten- give effort to his work. Amen. And I believe you do the first two right, you'll do the third one without any question. I believe you and I worship the right way and we get in the word, we'll want to work. But just because you work don't mean you worship, it don't mean you get in the word. And a lot of people I know work and they do it for the wrong reason. Notice what he says. It's Bible, verse number 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according to what? As his work shall be. Now I understand he's not talking about salvation. We can't work for our salvation. He's not talking about that. I want to ask you, so what, what is my work? I pastor, is that my work? I'm a preacher, is that my work? What's your work? Well, I'm a fireman, I'm a lawyer, I'm a, I'm a doctor. Is that your work? See, when you study out, and you don't, you don't have to turn there. Actually, I want you to. Genesis chapter number two. Yes, go, we'll finish here. Our work, listen, I'll tell you what our number one purpose is, is to tell people about Jesus. That's our number one purpose, is to tell people about Jesus. The greatest fruit of a Christian It's telling somebody else about how to be a Christian and seeing them get saved. That's the greatest fruit. He that winneth souls is wise. Isn't that what the Bible says? He that winneth souls is wise. That's the greatest fruit as a Christian, as a child of God that you can have. Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. Notice what the Bible says here. Verse number 8. What is my work? Listen to this. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put a man whom he had formed. Go down to verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. All right, so stop there for a second. So what's he doing? He's putting him in the presence of God. Listen to me. He's putting him in the presence of God. God said, this is where I want you to be. You're in my presence right here. Are you with me? What happens in the present? You say, well, what's my work, Brother Jason? What is my purpose? I mean, listen, I serve in the church. I got a job. What's my work? 
I'll tell you where you're going to find it. It's going to be in the presence of God. Maybe we haven't found it because we ain't been in His presence as much as we say we have. Are you listening to me? Biblically backing that up, notice why. Because the Bible says in verse number 15, He put him in the Garden of Eden to what? Well, there's His purpose. To dress it and to keep it. See, when you and I get in God's presence, we find out what God wants us to do. It's amazing. I talk to people sometimes like, I just don't know what the Lord wants me to do. Get in God's presence. Stay in God's presence. That way you can hear His voice clearly and not hear about 15 other voices at the same time. Are you listening to me? A man, a man, a man in the will of God and in the purpose of God is happy and the happiest and most blessed that he can be. But the most miserable person that you can have is not somebody lost. Listen to me. It's a Christian without any purpose. Are you hearing me, church? The most miserable person that you, you and I can know is somebody that is, is not even with purpose, that's, that's saved. And like, what am I here for? They're trying to find it in the church. They're trying to find it from the preacher. They're trying to find it from mom and dad. They're trying to find it in job and money. You only find that in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I was speaking to a men's conference a couple years ago, and I say it often when I'm doing it. What happens? You take a plant out of the ground, what happens? It dies. You take it, that's the environment it's supposed to be in. You, you take a fish out of the water, what happens? It dies. You take, you take a biblical man, a Christian, out of the will of God, what happens? It dies spiritually. Do you understand that? If you and I was walking, listen to me. If you and I was walking down the road and we see a fish just sitting on the side of, on the bank, we're going to say, well, that fish ain't where it needs to be. You know what the world looks at when they see us? You know what they say? I thought you said you were saved. What are you doing hanging out down here? I thought you said you were saved. What are you dating these kind of girls? I thought you said you were saved. What are you doing in this situation? And we wonder why our life don't have a testimony. People are looking at us and they're saying, I thought you were saved. You don't even look like you belong here. Meanwhile, they're right, and we are at most miserable, heartbroken. Because we believe Jesus is coming back, and we believe that without a doubt that he's coming soon, but we're not where we need to be. So I'll close with this tonight. If you believe he's coming back, what is it we need to change? If you believe he's coming back, what do we need to change? If you believe he's coming back, what do we need to add? What do we, what do we need to start doing? Amen. Talk to some of the ministry leaders. They said, this is completely different than what we've been doing. I know. <laughs> but if Jesus comes back, I don't, want, I don't want him to see us busy just doing stuff for ministry. I want him to see us busy calling people, loving them, texting them. Listen, if we're going to cultivate something, we're going to get it right. Let's don't, let's don't get the calendar right. Let's don't get the camps right. Let's don't get the, the meetings right. Listen, let's get our love for one another right. Preach on, preacher, preach on. That's what matters. That's what matters. If I get someone to the piano, I'm done. And she makes her way. She begins to play when she gets there. Will you stop for a moment? Maybe you heard everything, maybe you didn't hear everything, but you heard what you needed to hear. The Holy Ghost is big enough, He'll let you hear what you need to hear. Listen to me, will you, will you ask yourself and answer this question? What do I need to be different in? What do, how do I need to live different if I believe Jesus is coming back? If I believe that God is God and Jesus is my Savior and I believe He's alive, well, listen, even children know things have been different lately. And you know as well as I do, as the day comes and approaches, it's going to get even more crazy and chaotic. What do you want you to do? You want this next generation of kids to be looking around wondering what's going on or just be like, I know what's going on. Jesus is coming back. Are you hearing me? We better start now. Nolan turned 14 the other day. And I know I'm, I'm being too personal, but it's fine. Every day, every day I realize I should have done this yesterday. 
You can do as much as you think you need to do, but then you just realize, I could have done this better. You know, my greatest fear is, Brother Shane, that when he steps out, when he's 18 or 19 or 20 years old, that I'll be, still be saying, I wish I would have, instead of I'm glad I did. I don't want him to look around and just be passive and, forgive me, be ignorant as if everything's going to be all right. No, I want, I want these young people, these teenagers, the next generation, I want our church. Just because you're a church and you're older don't mean you understand everything. Listen, you can be, you can be old in years but still be spiritually immature. Amen. This is the time. This is the time to be serious about the Lord. This is the time to be serious. If you, if you had one night to live, what's going to change right now? If you knew that tomorrow Jesus was coming back, what's going to change right now? What friends would change in your life? What habits would change? What priorities would change? What would you sit down and talk to your spouse about? Who would you call and ask for forgiveness before Jesus comes? Are you listening to me? What would you make a priority in your life? What would change? What would you talk to your children about and make sure that it was right instead of just hoping so or thinking so? Amen. And I believe tonight, listen, we have a chance to say, Lord, this is going to be different in my life. Might not be perfect, but I believe you're coming back and I believe you're coming soon. And Lord, I choose to start living that way I choose our father I love you and I thank you for it is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in and I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you if somehow some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior and I want you to know that the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust Him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you and this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way and there's something heavy on your heart, again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.